uh, today our topic is ventricular septal defect. So uh, the predominant uh, emphasis is going to be on the diagnosis and the medical management. However, for the diagnosis, we will go through a little into the embryology and anatomy and then go uh, into uh, ventricular septal defect is special in many ways. Uh, we need to understand that it's the second most common congenital heart disease, uh, second to bicuspid aortic band. Practically, it's the CHD, which is most common in terms of symptoms, and it accounts for 20% of the total congenital heart diseases. Hence, we understand that it's a, uh, it's a very important uh, entity to be understood in detail. Sometimes it's an isolation and sometimes it's a part of a complex congenital heart disease. But what we will see today is only going to be in isolation. Ventricular septal defect is also one of the CHDs which is commonly associated with non-cardiac anomalies, especially genetic chromosomal anomalies. And uh, one more specialty of ventricular septal defect is it is one heart disease which has higher incidence in fetal life and in newborn period. Uh, this is because there are certain VSDs which could close spontaneously and hence whatever we see in fetal life is not actually what we see in postnatal life or what we are picked, what is picked up postnatally. Uh, another important thing is uh, VSD is commonly found in 3.3% of first degree relators. So as in general we understand the recurrence risk, it also goes strongly with children with VSD and their families screening. Now with this understanding, we will see the uh, embryology. And ventricular septal defect is uh, because of a deficiency of growth or a failure of alignment or fusion of the component parts. So what are the parts from which the interventricular septum is formed? Now, as we can see, this is the sagittal cut off the right atrium and the right ventricle in primitive stage where you have the bulbar septum superiorly and the interventricular septum from the floor. So what happens is the interventricular septum grows superiorly and the bulbar septum grows inferiorly and tries to meet in the center. At the same time, the gap is also filled by the atrioventricular cushion and it's proliferation. That means we have the atrioventricular cushion tissue here and there is some tissue which is produced because of proliferation from the AV cushion. So these are the four components which contribute to the development of interventricular septum. If there is a deficiency of growth of any of these parts or if lack of fusion of the component parts happen, then it's going to cause interventricular septal defect. A little more into the membranous septum. So here we can see that this is the AV cushion and this is the proliferation of AV cushion. And the AV cushion itself gives rise to the atrioventricular part of the membranous septum. So this part is the posterior most part of the membranous septum and it separates the right atrium and the left ventricle. Whereas the proliferation of the AV cushion gives rise to the membranous septum, which is the interventricular septum, separating the LV and the RV, and relatively, it is the anterior part. Now, the membranous part of the interventricular septum is different compared to the rest of the interventricular septum. How is it different? It's because this is the only part of the interventricular septum which is fibrous. The rest of the septum is muscular in nature. So with this understanding of the embryology, now let us go into a little of anatomy. I would suggest that it's very, very important for us to go through the right ventricular anatomy before we try to understand the ventricular septal defect. And this is because uh, the formation also happens in relation the deficiency also happens in relation to the uh, right ventricular morphology. And finally, the classification also happens in terms of interventricular uh, septum morphology of the right ventricle. So now we can see this, the first figure. This is the right atrium and this is the right ventricle. This is the inlet and this is the outlet. 
So we can see here, this is the tricuspid valve and this is the pulmonary valve. So this is the ventricular arterial junction. Now in this uh, figure, we can see that this is the right ventricular side of the interventricular septum. And if we look into it in detail, we need to understand that there are four types of uh, bands. The first band is the parietal band. The second band is the infundibular band. The third band is the septal band. And the fourth band is the moderator band. So there are four types of band on the right ventricle. There are different terminologies used for different uh, uh, structures. However, we need to understand that there's a little overlap. And we need to know what is denoting what at the end of it. So different books might mention different words for the same structure. So let us see in this figure what is the ventricular infundibular fold. So the ventricular infundibular fold is the fold which separates the tricuspid valve from the pulmonary valve. So that's the ventricular infundibular fold. As you can see in this figure, this is the tricuspid valve and this is the pulmonary valve. The fold in between is the ventricular infundibular fold. Now, we can understand that the word outlet septum is used to separate the aorta and the pulmonary artery, which we cannot see in these figures. So that is the septum which is between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, between the two arterial valves, is the outlet septum. The third structure is the parietal band and the parietal band is the muscle band which connects the RV free wall to the interventricular septum. So as you can see here in this figure, the parietal band is the band which separates the RV free wall from the interventricular septum. And the parietal band is also called the supraventricular crest. So different terminologies, again, you might find it in different places. The third component is the septal band. Septal band is the starting of the outlet portion of the right ventricle. And it's also named as septomarginal trabeculation. This septal band actually has the anterior limb and the posterior limb. And you can see here that the supraventricular crest rests between the two limbs. The septal band, again, we know that it's the outlet part. However, below that is the moderator band, and the moderator band connects the septal band to the base of the anterior papillary muscle. So as we can see in this figure, the septo, here, the septo marginal trabeculations, these are the septo marginal trabeculations or the septal band, which has the anterior and the posterior leg. And this is the moderator band, which connects the septomarginal trabeculation with the anterior papillary muscle. As we can see in this figure, so this is the parietal band. Parietal band is the one which connects the RV free wall to the interventricular septum. The septal band or the septomarginal trabeculation, this is the moderator band. So parietal band, septal band, and the moderator band, the three bands which we can see when we open up the RV. The outlet septum is the septum which separates the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So now with this understanding, we will go to the uh, next figure, which is also important for us because the membrane septum, a part of the interventricular septum, is very close to the conduction system. And so we need to understand that this is how the membrane septum lies and this is how the conduction system lies. And hence, it has a peculiar relationship to the conduction system in contrast to the inlet area. We will see as we go further. And the triangle of cop, which is also very close to the membrane septum. This is important when we try to understand how a membranous VSD is closed surgically and what risks we have in relation to a patch closure of the membranous septum versus the other VSD closure. Now, first of all, we will see the classification based on the anatomy. Uh, Kirkland has classified the VSD, the interventricular septum, into four parts. But primarily, we need to understand that 
there is a primary component which is the fibrous part of the septum which is the membranous septum. The membranous septum is a very very small structure. In adult heart it is around 5 millimeters only. So in pediatrics it is going to be very small. And that is the part which is actually sort of translucent. If you look at the right ventricular uh, cavity through from the RV side, you will see that this is actually can make the light enter through it in contrast to the rest of the septum. So that's how you can easily pick up the membrane septum. This is the fibrous septum and the rest of the septum is muscular which goes like a fan from the membrane septum. So if you look at the membrane septum, the one which goes superior anteriorly is the outlet septum, the one which goes posteriorly is the inlet septum, and the rest of the septum is the trabecular septum. Remember that when we use the word membrane, it is not true because it's very small most of the time. The defect lies in, in this area and it includes the defect in the surrounding areas. And hence the word peri or more appropriately paramembranous VLT is utilized. Membranous VLTs account for approximately 80% of all the VLTs. And here as we said the bundle lies in the postero inferior margin of the VLT. So we will go back to the previous uh, figure and see the membranous VLT is here and the bundle lies postero inferiorly. And hence, when the, um, when the surgeons want to try closing this, you will realize that they will actually be very, very careful in this area. And most of the defects you will see in the posterior inferior margin. Because they want to avoid heart loss, you would probably be very careful in this area. Uh, Garbodi defect is the defect where you have shunt from the left ventricle to the right atrium and as we saw because the membranous part of the septum has two components it's the interventricular component and the atrioventricular component which cause the two garbodi defect now coming to the second commonest type of defect which are muscular defects the muscular defects account for approximately 8 to 10 percent of the total defects which are defects lying in the trabecular septum now these defects are again divided into predominantly four parts, the anterior, mid and posterior and apical and this differentiation happens based on the different bands which we studied. So something which is anterior to the septal band is the anterior trabecular VSD, something which is beneath the septal band is the mid, beneath the septal tricuspid leaflet is the posterior and apical means it's below the moderator band. Mm -hmm. Just to correlate, we will go back to the figure here to realize that this is the septal band. Something which is anterior and posterior to the septal band is the anterior and mid. The apical ones are below the uh, moderator band. And the posterior ones are below the septal tricuspid leaflet. So this is how the trabecular VSDs are differentiated. And next comes the outlet and the inlet. When we use the word outlet, that's the defect in the outlet septum. That means the defect between the aorta and the permeate artery, which could be either sub-aortic or sub-pulmonic. Sub-aortic VSDs are infracrustal and sub-pulmonic VSDs are supracrustal. So again, we go back to this figure to realize what is supracrystal and infracrystal. That means it's above the supraventricular crest or crista supraventricularis and something which is below is infracrystal. Now with this, these are the subarterial VSDs which are much less common in certain populations and account for 5% of the total defects and because they are very close to the aortic valve, well, they commonly have uh, prolapsing right or non-coronary cusp and then the last section is the inlet VSD. The inlet VSD accounts for approximately 8% of all VSDs and because this VSD is in a different position, here you can see that the bundle is going to be lying superiorly. So just to summarize, 
Uh, Kirkland has classified type 1 as sub arterial, type 2 as membranous, type 3 as inlet, and type 4 as muscular. The most common defect is membranous, and the second most common is muscular. And then the bundle lies pushed to inferiorly to the membranous defect, whereas superiorly to the inlet defect. And cusp prolapse is more common in sub arterial and sometimes in membranous. So, this is how we would classify anatomically the VSD. Now, looking a little into hemodynamics, uh, we need to understand the basic difference between the pulmonary arterial hypertension concept and the pulmonary vascular resistance concept. So, what happens is that at birth, the pulmonary vascular resistance is high, and normally it becomes uh, to a normal range within two to three weeks, though a predominant drop in PBR happens in the first 72 hours. Now, when we have intracardiac shunt, the pulmonary vascular resistance usually takes a little longer, up to 6 to 10 weeks uh, to fall. And that means that once the pulmonary vascular resistance falls, then only the pulmonary blood flow can increase. And so this mechanism explains why children with ventricular septal defect have symptoms not at birth. This is an important understanding because if you have symptoms at birth in a VSD, that means there is something additional also there. It is unlikely that an isolated VSD will have symptoms in the first one week of life. You can have lesions like associated coarctation, a sizable PDA or an aortic pulmonary window, or mitral valve disease or aortic valve disease which can produce symptoms earlier, or even any ventricular agitation, which could add to the symptoms. Um, so th the component uh, which the VSD is important is pulmonary blood flow and the pulmonary vascular resistance, and both are exactly opposite in the sense the, the moment the PVR falls, the pulmonary blood flow increases. Also, the RV compliance, which actually does not play an important role in VSD. However, it's important to understand that RV compliance improves as the child grows older during neonatal period. So now here we can see that the three predominant chunks which we have are the ASD, the VSD, and the PDA, and how is VSD different than the ASD and the PDA? The flow depends upon what is important. Now, in an ASD, the flow depends upon the RV and the LV compliance. That means the distensibility of RV and LV. And the amount of flow which happens is usually small, and it happens in diastole. Whereas in ventricular septal defect, the amount of shunt depends upon the size of the VSD and the resistance. The resistance means the difference between the systemic and the pulmonary vascular resistance. That is what is going to decide the flow in VSD, and the flow in VSD happens in systole. In contrast to a PDA, where though the same factors are responsible, for the amount of flow into the pulmonary circuit, the flow happens in systole and diastole both. I hope this is uh, clear because the basic difference between the uh, hemodynamics is important for us to understand why different diseases present in different timings. Now, there's a second classification for VSD which is based on the size and the hemodynamics. So the first classification was based on its anatomy, which is actually more important when we are doing investigations like ECHO and looking for complications, prognosis, and management. However, the symptoms are going to be based not on the position, but on the size and its hemodynamics. So now let us look into how do we differentiate the small, moderate, and large VSDs. So basically, VSDs are classified into small, moderate, and large. And let's look into large first. Now, initially, they used to classify large VSDs as more than two-thirds of the aortic root or more than one centimeter per meter square. However, it's practically not utilized in terms of um, manually doing the measurement in every child. Uh, however, I think it's a little subjective understanding. We do not have a measurement as a cutoff, but we could use the aortic root 
subjectively to compare it. And if it's anything more than two thirds of the aortic root, we would say that it's large. So say for a newborn, the aortic root is approximately going to be around eight to nine millimeters. So anything more than two thirds of it is going to be a large VSD. When we say it's a large VSD, we understand that it's an unrestricted communication between the right ventricle and left ventricle. And hence, we usually do not have any pressure uh, difference between the RV and the LV. And the RV pressures are more than two-thirds of LV pressures. The QPQS is expected to be more than two to one. That means the pulmonary blood flow is two times more than the aortic blood flow. Okay, is there any uh, question in between? No. Um, and if we look into the uh, clinical or investigations, we will see that in a large VSD, we will have left heart volume overload significantly appreciated. These children are expected to go into failure and the pulmonary vascular resistance may again go up because of excessive flow into the pulmonary circuit. So these are large VSDs where we have QPQs of more than 2 is to 1. That means the left heart is dilated. The PA pressures are more than 2 thirds systemic, and these children are symptomatic. Let's go to the small size VSD. Small size VSDs are defined as VSDs which are less than one third of aortic root or less than 0.5 centimeter per meter square. And because they are small, there is a restriction and the pressure between the right ventricle and the left ventricle is significantly different and the RV pressures are less than 0.3% of LV pressures. The, there is a little increase in the pulmonary blood flow, but it's not more than 1.5 into 1 because of which the left heart is not dilated. These children are not at risk of failure or increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance though they may develop aortic regurgitation based on the position of the VSD and they may also develop endocarditis. So we need to know small VSD, their size is small, the PA pressures are normal, the amount of left heart dilatation is not there because the QPQS is less than 1.5 is to 1. So on echo you will not see any left heart dilatation in a small VSD. So what happens in moderate VSD? How do we define? They basically defined as size between one third and two third of the aortic root or between 0.5 and 1 centimeter per meter square. However, in terms of symptoms and PA pressures, they might be somewhere in between small and large. So a moderate VSD does have left heart dilatation because their pulmonary blood flow is between 1.5 and 2 is to 1. They may or may not have failure. The pulmonary vascular resistance is usually low. They do not develop obstructive pH. The PA pressures may be high, but usually not more than two thirds systemic. So this is how moderate VSD are somewhere in between small and large. Now with this understanding, uh, this concept we need to understand that what is the difference between the pulmonary arterial hypertension and pulmonary vascular resistance. Now this is a very simple formula which we all know that the flow and the resistance two things decide the pressure. So we can have uh, the calculations of cardiac output and the pulmonary blood flow based on this uh, formula. So we know that the pulmonary blood flow and the resistance, both these components decide the pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now initially, when we have a large VSD, a large VSD has significant increase in the flow and that is what causes severe pH which is hyperkinetic in nature. So that pH is hyperkinetic in nature. Whereas over years, when they develop a vascular obstructive disease and they develop the PA pressures which are high at that point in time it's obstructive. Also remember that the pulmonary blood flow and the pulmonary vascular resistance they are inversely proportionate as we saw before. However the PA pressures are always going to be high for a large VSD. 
So BA pressures are high for a large VSB, even when the PBR is high on day one, or at 10 years of age, when the PBR is high, the PA pressures are high. When the PBR is low, when the child is in failure, the PA pressures are still high. So that's how we would be very careful using terminology like the child has severe pH or the child has increased polyvascular resistance. So with this understanding, the large VSB, when do they present? So we know that at birth, they are usually asymptomatic because the resistance is high and it does not allow increased pulvy blood flow. Whereas at three months, they become symptomatic. This is approximate three months. There are children who become symptomatic a little earlier, as early as four weeks. And the children who have delay in fall in pulmonary vascular resistance, and they become symptomatic at later six months. And then again, they may develop obstructive pH and become asymptomatic, for example, at 10 years of age. However, they have severe pH throughout their life. So what is important is to pick them up in this situation and close them at this stage before they reach here, though clinically the child becomes better. So this is how the PBR is high, PBR is low, and again PBR is high. However, the pH is severe. This particular slide I have kept so that when you use terminologies while presenting cases or for your own understanding, you do not get confused between resistance and arterial pressures. So now what do we know? When you have large VSD, you have symptoms usually after 46 weeks. Again, once again, very, very important. Before this, if you have symptoms, be very careful to consider VSD to be responsible. So you have symptoms by 46 weeks. So if you have a large VSD at birth, you can tell them safely to follow up four weeks later, making sure that you have ruled out other associations. Look for dysmorphism clinically. Symptoms they will present in terms of failure to thrive, tachypnea, suppressed suck cycle, sweating, lower respiratory infection, and chest retractions. On examination, you will find active picardium. Most of them will have a gallop rhythm, a short systolic murmur because of increased flow across the pulmonary band, a mid-diastolic murmur, at the effect because of increased flow across the mitral valve, the second heart sound is split and the P2 is loud. There could be hepatomegaly, cardiomegaly. Remember, all VSDs in general, the JVP is not raised. Though in a younger child, it gets sometimes difficult to appreciate JVP, but it's never raised in a large VSD because we have an unrestricted communication between the two ventricles. So large VSD typically presents in failure between 4 and 12 weeks. There are children who do not have symptoms even till 12 weeks. What do we do? So these subset of children where the pulmonary vascular resistance has refused to fall, but you still have a large VSD and severe pH, you need to carefully decide and understand that a huge subset of these children might show fall in pulmonary vascular resistance and pH if you close the VSD, and especially these children, we need to close them a little earlier compared to children who have frank symptoms. Now, these children, if you do not pick them up over time, may develop high pulmonary vascular resistance as we saw in the previous slide, and that's what causes a regression of symptoms because it does not allow a lot of pulmonary blood flow to enter into the lung circuit. So the symptoms of failure typically disappear and they become reasonably asymptomatic. However, to some extent, they may continue having limitation in activities and exertional dyspnea, which could get worse as the child grows older. And as the child develops more and more uh, involvement of the uh, lobes and also some amount of uh, uh, right ventricular uh, dysfunction, they may develop chest pain and syncope. Though syncope is less common in children with large VSD because cardiac output is maintained at the cost of desaturation. On examination, how do we pick them up? So it's very important because you will have children between the previous situation and this situation sometimes in the gray zone and not typically with uh, not typically with high pulmonary vascular resistance which is well established. Now let us first see if you have high pulmonary vascular resistance, how do they look? So they desaturate. 
they have desaturation and they will have clubbing. The murmur is hardly anything. You will have a left parasternal lift because of right ventricular hypertrophy. You will have right ventricular impulse and a palpable second heart sound. No MDM and no ST. Remember the mid diastolic murmur and ST are signs of operability. There could be a pulmonary regurgitation murmur in the pulmonary area. And the most important sign is second heart sound, which becomes similar. So if the child is clearly inoperable, you have a second heart sound, which is loud and single. Single second heart sound in absence of MDF is very classical of inoperability. And if you have additionally desaturation and clubbing, it could support your findings. So somewhere in between in the gray zone, you may not have all typical features of increased family vascular resistance. Now coming to the small VSD, these children are asymptomatic as a rule. They have a significant pressure difference between the RV and the LV, which produces a murmur, which is pan-systolic throughout the systole of three or four. So they may have a thrill at the left sternal border. They do not have diastolic murmur, flow murmur at the mitral area because your bundle blood flow is not significantly elevated and your second heart sound is completely normal. Now with this understanding, we see what happens in moderate VSDs. So moderate VSDs, as we know, they may or may not be symptomatic. And if they are symptomatic, you will have some symptoms of failure. However, there is a pressure difference between the RV and the LV, and hence, you will have a pan-systolic murmur of usually grade 3 by 6. Uh, MDM is uh, usually present because they have increased pulmonary blood flow at the mitral area. And the second heart sound is split, but the P2 component is lesser than the A2 component. So in these children, you have evidence of left-sided heart dilatation, sometimes failure. The second heart sound is split and the P2 component is not louder and you have a pressure difference between the LV and the RV, though you might have symptoms of failure. So now these are the clinical features of a large VSD, small VSD, and a moderate VSD. So typically, if we see in this slide, this is a restricted VSD. A restricted VSD, that means you have a pressure difference between the RV and the LV. And this can be typically a small VSD or even sometimes a moderate VSD. This muscular VSD sometimes do not produce murmurs throughout systole because it completely closes in the uh, middle part of the systole and the murmur may be short. Now, if you have additional complications, like if you see in this, that the pulmonary vascular resistance has increased, then you hardly have a murmur in systole. You have an early diastolic murmur, which is the pulmonary regurgitation murmur. However, the second heart sound has become single in contrast to the small and the moderate PSD. So now with this, we just run through a little bit on the natural history of VSD because it could be overlapping. And the VSD can have spontaneous closure, can develop right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, can develop aortic regurgitation because of cusp prolapse, can develop LVOT obstruction, can develop pulmonary vascular disease, and can have infective endocarditis. And we need to understand that all these is basically depending on the position, the size, the number, and the associated effect we have in Jakarta. Now, we are not going to go into the natural history in detail today, but remember that whenever we are doing an echo, it is a conscious way of looking into these things and these things together. That means we try to look at the position, the size, the number of ESD and associations, and also, whether we have a reduction in size, whether we have an RVOT muscle bundle, cusp, flaps, subaortic membrane, or pulmonary vascular disease. So, uh, what investigations we would uh, do for a VSD? We do a basic uh, protocol of ECG, X ray, and echo. Catheterization is not included as the basic diagnostic way uh, because we do not need catheterization. 
However, there is a little role of cat uh, in BSD, which we will look as we move further. Now, what do we do in uh, what do we look in the ECG? Is ECG gives us an understanding about the physiology. What does the X-ray give us? Again, physiology. And the echo gives us anatomy and physiology both. When we say physiology, what all we look into the ECG? We see for the volume overload of the left heart. It gives us an idea about the size of the VSD. If left heart is dilated, it means that it is either a moderate VSD or a large VSD. And if the left heart is normal, it means that it is a small VSD. Normal heart size in a VSD has to be a small VSD. And it also gives us an idea about the pulmonary vascular resistance based on the chamber dilatation. So, if it's a small VSD, then we have a normal ECG. And if we have a moderate VSD, what are we looking into the ECG is one, the left hand dilatation, and second, sometimes the axis can give us a clue about the position of the VSD. So, if we have a leftward superior axis, it could be a part of inlet VSD or muscular VSDs, especially multiple muscular VSDs. So, if the QRS axis is leftward superior, you need to suspect inlet or multiple muscular VSDs. And if there is left atrial or left ventricular enlargement, then it means that it's either a moderate VSD or a large VSD. The left atrial enlargement is typically seen as broad notched P waves in lead 1 and 2 and a broad terminal P wave in B1 and LVH multiple waves to see, but in general, they have tall R with tall P in lead 2, 2, 3 AVF and also V5 and V6 with prominent Q in V5 and V6. Now, if it's a large VSD, you will include all those what we see in terms of left heart dilatation. But sometimes, very commonly, you have biventricular hypertrophy where you have right and left heart dilatation both. So, you have deep Q with tall R and P in V5 V6. Cat's vascular phenomena is a situation in a large VSD where you have prephasic RS complexes in the mid pericardial leads. If it's ease and mangers, can we suspect it on ECG? Yes, you will have more of right heart dominance, including occasionally right heart dilatation, but commonly RVH. That means you have a tall monophasic R wave and a small Q and an S in V1. If you have a Garbodi defect, what happens? You have an LV2 right atrial shunt. That means you have all four chambers dilatation. So if you have biatrial and biventricular enlargement, suspect LV to RA shunt in addition to LV to RV shunt. So as we can see here in this figure, this uh, you can see that the left ventricle dominance is there, though you do not see left atrial enlargement. And this is an ECG of typically a large VSD with low pulmonary vascular resistance. And if you see here, you can see large equiphasic. Um, positive and negative waves in the mid precordial lead. So this is cat spatial phenomena for a large VSD. And as you see here in the CCG, you can see here that the lead one has uh, typically a significant RVH and right atrial enlargement. This is a typical ECG of a VSD which is not operable. There is hardly any left-sided ventricular forces and it's more of right ventricular dominance. Now in chest X-ray, what do we see? So as expected, small VSDs are normal. However, moderate VSD, you will see cardiomegaly with increased pulmonary vascular markings which is central and peripheral both, your main pulmonary artery is dilated and your branch P is also appear dilated with the LA and LV type of cardiomegaly. So in a moderate VSD, because left heart is dilated, you have cardiomegaly and increased pulmonary vascular markings, which you also see in a large VSD with low pulmonary vascular resistance. But when the pulmonary vascular resistance increases and the pulmonary blood flow reduces, your heart size comes back to normal However, you have a typical pruning where the main pamiyati is dilated and the outer third of the X-ray does not have 
vascularity, there is reduced vascularity in the outer one third. And in a Garbodi defect, typically, it's a ball shaped appearance. So, as we can see here, you can see the difference of the vascularity. Uh, you have more endon vessels, and the vascularity seen in the distal one third of the lung field also. Whenever you have low pulmonary resistance, whereas when you have high pulmonary resistance, you have the main pulmonary artery and the proximal hilar pulmonary artery is dilated, but the distal pulmonary arteries are not dilated. There is a reduced vascularity in the distal pulmonary artery with a right ventricular apex in contrast to a biventricular apex when your pulmonary vascular resistance is reduced. So now this is what we see on uh, X-ray. Now coming to the echocardiography, uh, I think because we do not have time to go through every individual uh, structure on echo, we will just uh, see what is important for us uh, when we are seeing no VSD. So the most important, the size and the size. The size, you can measure it, but very, very important is to keep an eye on the left heart dilatation. If you have left heart dilatation, it's moderate or large. No left heart dilatation, it is small. The site of the VSD, as we discussed, whether it's membranous, inlet, outlet, or trabecular. The direction of shunt, whether it's from left to right, right to left, or bidirectional. And again, we know it is based on the difference between the pulmonary vascular resistance and the systemic vascular resistance. And that's going to give us the gradient across the VSD and assessment of PA pressures in absence of RV output track obstruction. Any secondary effect, please double check. If you have cusp prolapse, prolapse aortic regurgitation, or right ventricular outflow or left ventricular outflow obstruction. In membranous defects, carefully look for LV to RA shunt. Any associated anomalies, which are the common anomalies, as we said before, uh, PDA, ASD, coaptation, aortic valve disease, or mitral valve disease. So these are common things which an eye should look for whenever a VSD is suspected. Now we are randomly going to go through just let me know if uh, the image is playing for all of you. Kavita, I think the first image was not played. So you can see here that this is a parasternal long axis, and you will see a VSD just below the aortic valve. So whenever you see a VSD below the aortic valve, it is either a subaortic VSD or a typical perimembranous VSD. Now, is there a difference between a perimembranous and a subaortic? A little different. The membranous defect, as we say, they are close to the tricuspid valve, whereas the subaortic VSDs, when we say, they are typically away from the aortic valve but present in the outlet sector. So these VSDs, this VSD in this figure is a large VSD which is present below the aortic valve, and sometimes these are associated with malalignment of the interventricular septum and the outlet septum, you see the direction of the VSD and it is bidirectional. So when it's bidirectional, you will then try to look into other signs of operability in the child on echo in terms of left heart dilatation, in terms of pulmonary venous return, mitral valve inflow, etc. So the, uh, the first image which it didn't play actually showed Okay, so this is not playing, but this is typically a large VSD. Now, whenever you have a malaligned VSD, remember that it can be like a malaligned VSD in a heart which is like a tetralogy by anatomy. So, surgeons would use the term, it's a tough type of a VSD, though there is severe pH. So, physiologically, it does not fit into a uh, Tetralogy of fallow, but when the surgeon opens up, anatomy is important for them, and these VSDs are typically termed as top type of large malaligned VSDs. 
Now, here in this figure, this is very important for us because it shows lack of offset along with an inlet VSP. Now, what we see is the crux of the heart in this view, and crux of the heart is the posteriormost part of the interventricular septum. So, we can see the defect which is there in the inlet area. Now, whenever we see an inlet VSD, it could be a part of an AV septal defect, or it may not be a part of an AV septal defect. Inlet VSDs are typically the posterior most, uppermost part of the interventricular septum just below the AV valves. And sometimes they might be associated with straddling or overriding of the AV valves, and it's the posterior uppermost part. The rest of the septum that you see here in this view is the posterior, middle, and lower part of the septum, or you can use the term a pical trabecular septum, or, or the posterior part of the septum which lies below the septal pycus pit valve leaflet based on the definition which we saw some time ago. Now, I think, again, this is not playing axis, where you can see the aortic valve as a cross-section here, the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve. And there is a defect between, here you can see in the whole outlet septum is absent. So, though the septum close to the tricuspid valve is there, the whole subarterial area is absent. So, this is typically a subarterial VSD. The other way to name it is doubly committed VSD. So a doubly committed VSD is very close to the pulmonary valve, and the surgeons will get this through the pulmonary artery. So whenever you see a VSD in the outlet septum, it's important to tell whether it's subaortic or subpulmonic so that the approach makes a little difference. Now, as you can see, the right coronary cusp comes closer in the outlet VSD, and hence, you can have prolapse because of both the mechanisms, because of lack of support and because of venturi effect. Okay, now as we can see here in this figure, this is a parasternal long axis, and you can see a muscular or a trabecular defect which is present in the mid but predominantly in the lower part of the septum. I don't know, Kavita, why some are playing and some are not playing. Lower part of the muscular uh, septal defect. Now, whenever you see a trabecular defect, remember that you need to have an orientation from superior inferior understanding and intro posterior understanding. So, if you see a VSD at the level of aortic valve in the trabecular septum, we know that in terms of anterior mid posterior, it's in the middle part because it's at the level of aortic valve. Any VSD which is at the level of AV valve, it's a posterior VSD. Any VSD which is at the level of pulmonary valve is an anterior VSD. And any VSD which is at the level of aortic valve is somewhere in between in terms of entero-posterior relationship. There is in terms of superior-inferior relationship, you can see it in contrast to how far it is from the apex versus the seminal valves or AD valves. So this is below the middle part of the septum, closer to the apex in the mid-septum at the level of aortic valve. These VSDs are much away from the greater vessels, and hence it's easier for us to follow them up because they do not have the threat of developing outflow obstruction or cast prolapse. And we calculate the PA pressures based on the gradient between the two chambers and small VSDs, as you can see. They have uh, normal PA pressures, if, but if you have left heart dilatation, as you can see in this figure, it is not small, but it's a large VSD. No. I think I can go back to the original, uh, you know, backup images, and then we can run through the images. We will just finish off this slide of catheterization before that. Now, catheterization is done to only uh, address the concern about operability in a VSD. Otherwise, it's never done nowadays. 
Now, whenever you have an operability issue, you would categorize the child to calculate your due to QS and also effective public blood flow. Now, effective public blood flow is calculated whenever you have a baseline desaturation. That means that you have some component of right to left shunt in addition to the left to right shunt. So, effective blood flow is going to help you to calculate your right to left and left to right shunt separately. Your pulmonary vascular resistance and presence of additional VSDs, you could double check. Just a small note here or that. In general, you will use your LAO view to, to, to document your perimembranous and muscular VSD. But whenever you have an anterior muscular VSD or an outlet VSD, use RAO view. And if it's inlet, you will see a better clavicular view. Now, we will just uh, go, go into a little bit of, uh, about, uh, you know, few echo clippings in the backup uh, folder. And I just uh, want to show the perimembranous VSD, which you can see here that uh, the perimembranous VSDs are defects which are in the uh, closure to the tricuspid valve. Sorry, the thing is uh, actually not moving. Parasitic and short axis. Let me see if this is. Okay, so in this way you can see here the VSD which is closer to the tricuspid valve and it is in relation to the aortic valve is the perimembranous VSD. And this membranous defects are different in a way because you see them when you see the aortic valve and you are not sleeping. In contrast to the upper muscular VSD which you will find only when you start sleeping from uh, the aortic valve level and go down to the ventricular level. This VSD is also away from the pulmonary valve. All membranous VSDs are subaortic, but all subaortic VSDs are not membranous. And the perimembranous VSDs are also well seen from the subcostals, especially they are very well seen in this view when you have LV to RA shunt. So these uh, subcostal view is important, especially to pick up the LV to RV and the LV to RA. Now in this view, you can see that the VSD is below the aortic valve. So from subcostal, sometimes it gets difficult to say whether this is perimembranous or subaortic. However, when you go to parasternal short axis, and then you can differentiate them uh, between the subaortic and the perimembranous VSDs. The uh, subaortic VSDs are typically seen in the parasternal long axis, whereas the perimembranous VSDs are not seen in this view. The parasternal long axis, if you see a VSD, this is subaortic and not perimembranous. The perimembranous VSDs are seen when you tilt posteriorly in parasternal long axis. I think we will go back uh, with this few limited images uh, into the management. Now, in management, I just want to say two things. One is that, that your decision about management is basically dependent upon the type of the VSD, the number of VSD, its natural history, etc. And it's important for us to understand that 10% of large VSDs, if you do not operate, they will not cross their first birthday. Though it looks very simple, the disease is simple and completely treatable, if you do not focus on uh, the timing of treatment, you will lose 10% of the VSD. These are all treatable lesions. Second is spontaneous closure is rare in large VSD. So if you see a large VSD in the neonatal period, it is rare that these VSDs will close on their own. And 30 to 40 percent of moderate or small muscular VSDs or membranous VSDs will close spontaneously. Most of them will close by four years of age. 
So these three things are used to decide what do we do for VLTs. Now remember that till we decide that this is the ideal time for surgery, medical treatment is considered for symptomatic congestive heart failure in terms of diuresis and AC inhibitors. I do not feel there is any role for uh, digoxin in these children when the ventricular function is completely normal. Uh, what is the timing of closure? So this one important slide is there which needs to give you the message of what to do with these children. So now let us divide them between large, moderate and small and then go into the detail of individual types of VLTs. Now large VLTs will have severe pH irrespective of their position whether they are in the inlet, outlet or trabecula. They need to be closed by 3 to 6 months of age. You would close them at three months if they have uh, heart failure and you are not able to uh, achieve anything waiting till six months. If you have some weight gain and uh, the child is reasonably doing fine, you want a kg more during surgery, you could wait but not more than six months of age. With uncontrolled failure, you might consider treating them with surgery even as early as eight to 12 weeks. Coming to moderate VLTs. Now, if you have moderate VLTs, as we understand, you may or may not have failure. You may or may not have uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So, in these children, important is to see if they have symptoms and if they have pH. If they have pH, remember, by one year of age, you should close them. Do not wait for moderate VLTs with anything more than normal PA pressures for more than one year. Close them at one year. If you have symptoms in terms of respiratory tract infection and failure to thrive, you will close these moderate VSDs even earlier, typically between 6 months to 12 months of age. However, for moderate VSDs, if you do not have symptoms and you do not have PA pressures, you can wait till 2 to 4 years of age because we know that some of these VSDs can spontaneously close. Now, coming to the small VSDs. In general, small VSDs do not need closure. Remember wherever they are. Because closure risks are higher than not doing it. But what can go wrong with small VSDs? So if they are in the outlet area, typically the subpulmonic VSDs, you need to follow them up purely because they may develop aortic valve prolapse. And if they have aortic valve prolapse with small VSDs, then you need to close them by 2-3 years of age, irrespective of whether they have AR or not. However, if they have AR, then you will close them as soon as you see the aortic regurgitation. Now, this is for outlet VSD, but if you have perimembranous VSD with a cusp prolapse and no aortic regurgitation, that's not an indication. You can follow them up purely because their probability to develop aortic regurgitation is much lesser compared to outlet VSDs. But if perimembranous VSD has more than grade 1 aortic regurgitation, you will close them like outlet VSDs. If you have small VSDs in other areas, which is typically going to be the trabecular septum, then you will not close them anytime in life. However, they have a possibility of having infective endocarditis, and because of that, one episode of IE is actually a class 2B indication, very surprisingly. More than one episode is an indication for closing the VSD surgically. So I think uh, what we went through is uh, the embryology, the anatomy, the types of VSD, how do we pick them up clinically and with investigation, and what do we do to them in terms of management. I think uh, we are going to end up our session now. Any questions, uh, please feel free to ask.